All right, well then let's get started. Um, well, who do we have on the call? Let's start there. Uh, we have myself, Bernard Klein, Brad Sayers, Jeffrey Edwards, John Ebert, uh, Michael Schwartz, Nathan Savory, Wendy, uh, Ronitz Baker, and Yotam Rosen. And um, it's just a couple of minutes past the top of the hour, so we may have others joining us. Uh, and this is our first live video call uh, to discuss Peter Sloterdijk's book, uh, Bubbles, which is volume one of his Spears trilogy. And um, we're, we're just kind of coming off some technical difficulties. And I have, I have a kind of interesting story in the background, which I might share about the, something that's going on in my kind of spherological world uh, in, you know, at this at this very moment, uh, which I'm kind of transitioning from toward toward this space, um, but what I was what I thought we could do to kick this off is not just not to very quickly dive into the text, but to take some time to uh, establish something of our own sphere here. Uh, it's you know, one of the reasons that I have wanted to that I wanted to read this book. And one of the um, reasons why I want to read books in general with others uh, in a reading group or in book clubs or in this, these, kinds of, um, these kinds of spaces is because I've always felt that they create special kinds of, you know, what now we, I might call spheres, uh, special kinds of spaces where we can talk about things or go to certain depths or take certain perspectives that... Uh, that we wouldn't otherwise be able to in the course of our normal <clears throat> everyday discourse uh, or in the other spaces that we you know, inhabit and, and traverse. And so um, I want to pay attention to the fact that just by gathering together on this video call, even with its you know, various uh, technical um, drawbacks or glitches or bugs, um, but nonetheless as a pretty amazing thing that we could uh, be interfacing in this way, uh, that we're in in this moment creating a, a co-creating uh, a kind of sphere. Uh, if we are if we're going to take uh, Sloterdijk's language uh, for for what we're doing and apply it to ourselves, so uh, I don't want to dive right into the the text or into you know an exegesis or interpretation or critique or whatever other modes we might get into, but take some extra time here at the outset to. Uh, just kind of re resonate with each other and get to know uh, what we're each coming to this, you know, for or, or with, uh, and um, you know, not 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 we don't not not do not be too performative about it. I mean, like just spend a little time chatting to kind of get to know each other uh, before we dive into the text, because um, I, I have found doing these kinds of readings that. Uh, we can go pretty deep and we can, it, it can be pretty, um, it can be pretty, uh, uh, in, intimate in, in a certain weird way because we're very distant from each other. Uh, you know, we're looking at screens. I can't even see John right now. He's just a black screen in front of me, uh, but, but there's a, there's a kind of intimacy there. Not intentional. <laughs> and and th that intimacy is kind of, is what this book, uh, is, a, is about. Uh, that's, explicitly what uh, Sloterdijk uh, claims it's about is a, uh, a metaphysics of intimacy or, uh, or a story of, of, of how intimacies uh, arise or emerge in, in the human experience. So uh, why, why don't we just start by going around to the people that are here and taking a minute or two each to uh, introduce ourselves in whatever way we want to. It doesn't have to be a literal, you know, um, you know, life description um it could really be anything you want to say that would just register your presence with with the group um and uh perhaps why you know what brings you to this reading uh what you um uh you know what you might bring to it uh what your maybe an interest that you particularly have uh and and also i would personally like to hear what you think at the out you know just initially at the outset what you think we could do to make this a, a good, nurturing, um, challenging, and uh, fruitful space. I, I'd love to hear any thoughts on that as well. And we have a few more people joining. So um, 
so basically we're going to, I was just saying that we're going to go around and uh, introduce ourselves uh, and you'll get the gist of, uh, of, you know, what we're doing uh, if you haven't heard the intro. So, uh, John, would you like to start? Even though we can't sure, see I'll... you? Okay. Yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah, I'm fine with that. Um, I, uh, my, my background is uh, as a, um, I originally began as a uh, comparative mythologist. I started with the background uh, working on mythology with the Joseph Campbell Foundation back in the 90s. And then I gradually moved from that into media studies and then from media studies into a philosophical background, into learning uh, contemporary critical theory. And um, uh, Sloterdijk's uh, stuff on spheres appealed to me just as, as naturally as someone who was interested in critical theory and specifically theories about technology. And um, Sloterdijk is somewhat tech savvy. I mean, somewhat. No, I mean, for, for a German theoretician, there, there's, I mean, I think the French are a little more media savvy than, than, than the Germans are. But um, I linked up with Sloterdijk and I was uh, doing work for Semiotext, who put out the American uh, translation of spheres. And uh, I hooked up with them and they asked me to proofread the books. So I proofread them. And um, so, but I had already read Sloterdijk and I had already become familiar with him, not in the original German, but um, in the number of translations that have slowly accumulated over time. And uh, he's just appealed to me as one of the, the great contemporary theoreticians. One of the major attractions I, I think that he has for me is his readability. Amongst uh, contemporary theoreticians, he's extremely readable, extremely understandable. And that's, you know, that's a virtue. <laughs> that's not always a thing that you can trust for uh, contemporary critical theoreticians. And so his readability attracted me and his ideas about uh, spherology. I just think they're amazing ideas. So that's sort of my background, and I'm a scholar and a writer, and I've got books I've published uh, on various different aspects of contemporary culture, and um, I've just been publishing those over the decades, and um, I found Slaughter Deck to be very useful. So that's, I'll, I'll leave off with there and turn it over to, to you guys. Now, I'm just going to pick people, if that's okay. If you don't want to be picked, uh, let me know. Um, but I'll, I'll start with some folks that I know and then, and then include everybody. Um, Michael, Michael Schwartz, Michael, how are you? Hi, uh, my bad. I, I make a living as a professor here in Augusta. I teach art history and philosophy and write on critical theory. And I know Marco, and I, I'm doing this partly because of trust in Marco, um, from the integral world and the post integral world. And also because I, John, I, I love your books. I think they're outstanding. Well, thank you. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm speaking from someone who, you know, is in a comparative continental philosophy circle, a professional group. And I think your work is really just super. I learn a lot from them. So just want to say That's that. That's gratifying to hear. I, I appreciate it. Yeah, that. man. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I read Slaughter Dyke. You know, I read, try to keep up with things. And the two books I read by him were you, change, you Have to Change Your Life and the Wisdom Philosophy book. And I realized that the, the, the spherology um, thesis really is the background to that. And just reading uh, John's uh, ex, uh, discussion and reading this, and I'm getting a flavor of, of what's operative. And it's this issue, if we can jump ahead a little, of foam and how I'm, in, I'm interested in spiritual practice, or I don't even call it spiritual, but development of some kind. And there's an intensification of this. Like right now going on in Silicon Valley is something called Spiritual Technologies 2.0. It's an online um, webinar. And the intensification of offering development, developing the human being, now makes more sense to me. If you're in a condition of foam, you need a new immunological system. <laughs> and it seems to be real. It seems to be really actual. Um, and then in my, just one more last thing, in my work uh, in art history, I was recently reteaching uh, Raphael Stanza della Signatura, which is a kind of microcosmos. He's, the artist is now creating a microcosmos, the whole cosmos. But there's a beginning of a breakdown of something of the Ptolemaic security of that womb. And there's a hyper stress instructional there for development. So just as the Ptolemaic structure is starting to wobble, the instruction are is that the individual has to really hyper develop themselves. So I'm finding this to be already uh, from the outside really useful 
and I'm um, really looking forward to this. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, John, for doing this. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Mike. Michael. Um, how about Wendy? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so my name is Wendy. Uh, I met Marco when we did the uh, John Gebser Ever Present Origin Book Club last year. Um, I also met Ed at that time, so I want to say hi to Ed. I missed you guys. <laughs> um, I come to this from a being a student of consciousness. Uh, I'm very interested in learning different perspectives of way to view the world. Um, but at the same time, I'm very practical. I'm very pragmatic. So I'm always looking at ways to take these philosophical concepts and these new perspectives and bring them down and kind of apply them to some of the challenges that people are facing. Um, my professional background is I've got an IT background and a project management background. But right now I'm doing a business and career coaching. So I'm helping a lot of people trying to figure out how to deal with this new economic situation, how to translate their skills, how to find their worth and their place in this kind of shifting economic world and political world that we're living in. So um, very interested in this idea of consciousness being related to spheres and something that's more spatial bound than time bound. I tend to be very time bound myself, you know, deadlines and to-do lists and when are you going to get it done and how long is it going to take? And uh, this might be an interesting way to start looking at things in a different perspective and see how I can apply that to uh, my work and everybody else's work too. Okay, thanks, Wendy. How about uh, how about Ed? Oh, okay. Um, I have a very uh, weak uh, internet connection, so if you if I get garbled, it's not not just because I'm blithering. It's uh, it could be the technology. Uh, for those of you who read the um, first impressions uh, thread, I'm the curmudgeon. <laughs> I'm not. Uh, <laughs> I'm not the one that's all excited about this. I think that uh, John once uh, said in his uh, in his Gapser theories, he was talking about um, Spengler, and he said it was it was interesting for him because here were two people that looked at the same thing and saw something completely different. And when they were talking about how we viewed the uh, or how Spengler and Gapser viewed the uh, development of civilization, and and that's that's kind of how I feel about this. I, I know that a lot of you are all excited about about Slaughter Dyke, I'm, I'm interested in why all of you are so interested because I find him highly unreadable and highly, highly confusing. I'm, so I'm, I'm struggling a lot with this. And so I was hoping that this uh, little discussion group would help sort some of that out. Um, I'm reading him in German. I did get uh, through Google Books to look at the uh, introduction, well, not the whole introduction, but the uh, preliminary remarks. And I have to say that he's much more readable in English than he is in German. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, I've never heard that before. That's great. <laughs> so uh, we'll have to see how this works out. I'm, I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> All right. Um, that's interesting. Uh, we I've heard, I've heard people. Uh, I heard Love it. Uh, German scholars will read Heidegger in, in English as well, rather than German. So maybe there's some connection there. Um, well, when I when I, I I have read Heidegger, and and he's one of those people. Hegel's that way too. Sometimes you have to read things maybe five, six, seven times, and th and then it starts making sense. Well. It's not that I'm not trying. I, I read this first text five times, twice in English and and three times in, in, in German, and, and it's still just not making a lot of sense. So I'm looking for some pointers to help me find out what, what I'm missing. I'm obviously missing something. Well, maybe you can also <laughs> pop our particular bubbles if, if we're overexcited about it. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I do see lots of little things in there. You know, he makes a statement here. I go, oh, that's pretty interesting. And, you know, I was, I was reading his critique of cynical uh, reason, and there's, there's things in there. It's like, oh, well, this is, this is a real interesting little statement. But he just never follows up on it. And so when I try to get into it in, in any depth, it's like, well, okay, well, that went away. So I'll run after the next one. And, and, and that's, that's where I'm having my, my trouble you know, when I when I studied here in Germany, my uh, my anglistics professor had studied with Gadamer, so I'm I got really 
eaten into and formed into a very hermeneutic kind of background. So I'm always looking for the, you know, the whole context and what am I bringing and what am I forgetting and, and those kinds of things. And that's very difficult. I find with Slaughter Dyke because he just, he just doesn't stay on topic long enough to get a handle on him for me. Hmm. Okay. Uh, well, let's come back to this for sure. I think, I think there's some interesting. And again, uh, we, we all approach right. this very different. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to discuss that now. <laughs> All right. Well, how about uh, how about Nate? All right. Hello, everyone. Um, so I know Marco through my sister Caroline's involvement in the Cosmos Cooperative kind of uh, core founding team, uh, and uh, but I come from a, a kind of I don't know what to call it a a mixed background, which includes some, some philosophically oriented academic work. Uh, I did a master's degree in the field of communication, but in a particularly uh, philosophically oriented PhD kind of driven department. So I got a, a pretty good uh, immersion in, in reading this kind of stuff. Um, I actually felt compelled to join the Sloterdijk reading group once I, once I actually looked over what the book's topic and scope and, and stuff like that was. Uh, partly because, uh, again, from a communication background, I uh, have a very strong focus on the process of meaning making and the emergence of common belief or common identity or what uh, Sloterdijk would, would kind of generally refer to as this, this making of inner worlds uh, through, through an exchange or a process of developing meaning. Um, and so having studied at least at a, at a kind of superficial level in graduate school, some of the dialogic philosophers, the Levinas and, and Martin Buber and stuff, um, who also were responding to Heidegger and, and just reading kind of the intro to, uh, or a little bit about bubbles. I was like, okay, you know, I've been out of academia for, for a few years, but like this, this felt to me like the next logical thing for me to engage with as I, as I continue to try to work with that stuff. Um, which is to segue into the fact that professionally right now, I'm still trying to figure out how to pay the bills, but uh, I'm working on a project, which is as sort of similar to, uh, well, I have a similar orientation to what Wendy described, which is to say, I'm very interested in practically taking ideas and really turning them around into something tractable and something particularly for me uh, in the, in the building of communication technologies, which can mean a lot of different things, even even within my own my own way of seeing it. But essentially, I'm I'm looking to uh, build different ways of of communicating digitally that reflect deeper, richer, contemporary understandings of communication. Sloterdijk's interpretation of communication could certainly be included in that in that group of theories or ideas that I might be picking from as I as I develop this stuff. Um, and so I'm a few years removed from academia, but I feel like generally, you know, generally hoping I can hang with you guys. I feel, I feel confident that I'm, I'm able to parse at that level and uh, just excited to, to learn from everyone and, and see how, how it seems like everyone can take a work like this and, and sort of parse it differently. And so I'm really interested to see how, how we come apart and come together in terms of our interpretations and our understandings of, of the work and stuff. So. Cool. Thank you, Nate. Um, how about uh, Jonathan? Jonathan Cobb. All right. All right. Uh, so, um, yeah, I'm uh, I'm a I'm Jonathan. I'm a social worker by trade. I have uh, I dabble a lot in philosophy and uh, social theory and theology and stuff. Um, I had first uh, heard about this work a while back when I watched uh, John David Ebert's um, uh, YouTube videos on it. And I didn't really get it at the time, but uh, then when I saw the uh, his, his sort of introductory video for, for this uh, reading group. One thing that struck me was when he, when he talked about how about his Sloterdijk's philosophy of space, which uh, is really interesting because I'm I have an interest in like process philosophy and like you know Whitehead and Bergson's philosophy of time. And so I thought, hmm, so someone's trying to tackle space in a similar way. I thought that was a really novel kind of way of approaching it. So um, yeah that kind of piqued my interest and um, I, I just finished the book the other day so I Skipping around a bit doesn't uh, isn't too much of a problem, but um, I was really actually struck by a lot of the theological aspects of this book, like his, like his discussion of the Trinity and like guardian angels and 
and uh, the sort of uh, stuff about like how that what that says about intersubjectivity and um, are always sort of being with another in, in, in a sense. So, um, so yeah, I'm uh, I'm really excited to uh, see what what you guys uh, see in this, in this book and um, and in uh, reading through uh, the other two as well. So. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm uh, really psyched for that. Cool. Mm-hmm. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, Brad. Um, yeah. So hi, everybody. I was a part of the Gebser um, book reading last year. I guess it was the last year. Mm-hmm. But anyways, it was. Um, it was quite, um, I never heard of Gebser before that, and yet I really recognized there was someone who was way ahead of his time, and some of his ideas, you know, he's been long gone, but um, the participation in the group, the book reading itself, and just my own connecting some dots that included Gebser was, it had a pretty profound impact on me just maybe basically recognizing someone who was to be taken very seriously um, in this day and age. And um, we are in a huge transition worldwide. Basically, I see it as inside a chrysalis just being crushed and destroyed, like really globally. It's so many um, contributing factors, but probably technology and the automation it brings has been, you know, probably underestimated as one of the main causes to such turmoil in the world. And uh, when I, when this book reading was suggested, um, I guess I was fascinated by the title. Um, There was just something in those titles that kind of suggested a new language, uh, a new way of saying something important or even pushing into something new uh, with that new language. And so that's, I haven't started the book. It's right here. I've been busy. Um, I will be picking it up for sure. Um, Ed, your comments on have been, you know, it'll be interesting. And, and that's fine because it is going to be a, a personal uh, exploration as well as participating together and, and getting each other's um, perspectives on how it's hitting us. But I think it must be significant enough of a text to, you know, to um, that we could all look forward to, to, to getting into it and, and, and especially hearing what John has um, uh, to contribute also every time we meet. So just happy to be here and looking forward. And I should say also that um, the other thing that uh, has kept me in this community has been Marco's, um, I guess his, just his way of approaching and building this community. I've been impressed with that, Marco. Um, and I probably would think others have too. He's got a very good demeanor, uh, inclusive, and probably that comes from <laughs> your Ken Wilber days. But, you know, it, it is a, an enlightened perspective to be so inclusive. And I appreciate that in you. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. um. <laughs> Usually it just feels like some form of t- weird torture, but I, I I'll take it. Um, so th- we just lost somebody. Uh, Ed, I think, disappeared. Ed, okay. Uh, I'm sure he'll be back if he can be. How about Jeffrey? This, be, this is our first time meeting. And I should, just to say, uh, everybody here, we, I've met personally in some other context. Uh, many, um, I shouldn't many, but... A majority of uh, the folks here participated, maybe not a majority, like half, in a reading we did last year on um, a book called The Ever-Present Origin by Gene Gebser, which I, I know you uh, haven't read because you mentioned it on the forum, uh, but others are making references to that book. Uh, and we went through that book last winter uh, over the course of three months at much faster pace uh, than, we're, than we're doing this. Uh, it was really an intensive. And one of the reasons that I wanted to read Spheres uh, and Bubbles in particular was because of the theme of space in, 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 in distinction to or kind of whole, yeah, in contrast to the, the, the theme of the ever-present origin, the kind of primary theme of it, which was time. Uh, and in that respect, I'm, 
um, relating to uh, to Jonathan's uh, point earlier, uh, and as, as well as Brad, that in some way this seems like a, maybe a counterpoint or a continuation at the same time of a conversation that we we started uh, a year and, and so ago. Um, but anyhow, uh, it's good to meet you, <laughs> and yeah. uh, uh, I've been very interested in learning, if, you know, what you've been, out, what you're up to, what your research interests are, and what your work is actually in terms of applying uh, some of the uh, some ideas like Nate uh, to, you know, actual applications. Uh, so, okay. yeah. So um, uh, it's great to meet everybody and hear a little bit about uh, your stories and also how this conversation is managed which wasn't obvious to me at the beginning <laughs> but um, um, and I have a rather complex piece to talk about so I, I won't talk about it all I'll just give little glimpses of things that we're doing I am a senior academic I have had a quite extensive career in many different areas but uh, right now I work uh, in an area that is partly my own de development which is bridging the arts and the sciences in organic new ways. Um, that is a not doing either art nor science, but uh, something that is emerging between the two of them. Um, I have, I'm supervising a, direct, a graduate student directly in this area and I'm supervising several other graduate students doing a number of projects in relation to this. Uh, among the supervision of those graduate students, we have been looking at a number of philosophers, uh, four in particular we focus on. So that's William James and James uh, Gibson as a pairing um, on affordance theory and ecological psychology. Uh, we're looking at Deleuze, uh, who has a very particular interest in um, singularities, uh, which is an area that we're looking at. Um, uh, 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 Alfred North Whitehead, we've been looking at in terms of uh, process theory that was already mentioned. And Sloterdijk is the fourth uh, sort of area that we're looking at. Uh, so we're actually running a graduate seminar right now where we've been looking for the last several weeks at Sloterdijk. Um, and uh, so some of that may feed into the discussion here. Um, so uh, maybe that's, uh, uh, I mean, I have my, my origins, my training is in astrophysics, and my academic discipline is geomatics, which is essentially surveying. Um, and I work in the area of people with disability and in uh, designing environments. I work on smart environments and smart environments uh, for uh, enhancing the lives of people with disabilities. So that's the kind of uh, um, area that I'm working on. And um, I, so, so because my background is geomatics, which is a spatial discipline, I'm particularly focused on understanding how, um, how to develop things in relation to space. And Sloterdijk's take on space is very interesting. So... Uh, it's part of the interest in this work is to, to see if one can tease out of Sloterdijk's work something that could be applied in relation to some of this, the geospatial kind of uh, thinking around space uh, and the way it's used in, everyday, in the everyday world these days. So I think maybe I'll stop there because it's uh, too big a piece to, to talk about in it, it, it all in a few minutes. Hmm. All right. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, it's two more left, and then I think we can get into the book. How about um, Bernard? Bernard Klein. Hi, guys. Hey, my son wants me to read him a good night book. <laughs> <laughs> How about Bubbles? But yeah, that's perfect. Well, he wants me to read some children book. But, um, yeah, so um, I think it's an awesome project, what you're doing. I'm a philosopher, and I did my PhD with Sloterdijk. Um, and I, I also am an editor of Sloterdijk. I, I edited the book um, 
Selected Exaggerations, which is a collection of his interviews. I've read that. And I enjoyed that. Nice, nice job on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, basically, I did this book because um, as a student with him, he was never there. And uh, so I wanted to hear his voice because he wasn't in his seminars at the you know University of Karlsruhe, and um, <laughs> so I yeah so I collected all his interviews and um, we we in a long process uh, selected the best of them and eventually it was translated into English you know but it wasn't the intention originally I mean I was just. Um, intrigued by him as a thinker on stage, which is a um, a topic in its own. His coming, uh, because Lauderdijk distinguishes between being born and coming to life, or or you know, um, and coming to life for him. Uh, not everybody that's born is coming to life because coming to life has to do with coming on the stage. So um, this, uh, you know, this intrigued me because of the interviews he did. So um, that was my my access to it. I, I when I when I got, um, I, I'm always checking messages on Twitter about Slaughterdike. So this is how I got to you. So now we are in this infrasphere or sphere, so to speak. So, and now in the intimate space of a little sphere uh, <laughs> um, that was triggered by this Twitter message and I forwarded it to Slaughterdijk and he said, cool. Uh, I mean, he has a lot of um, invitations to the United States. Um, I think he could, you know, uh, have his, his life touring and, and talking and, or, or lecturing in the States. And he's just beginning to, to be a... Uh, uh, getting more broad audiences and um, I, I wouldn't call him an academic philosopher um, first of all he's not very much liked in academia but he's more an author and brings together poetry and uh, intellectualism um, so even though you I mean even though he has a lot of sources but he, he he doesn't treat them academically in in a way that a lot of academic philosophy is treated. So that's I think a good thing. Um, I'm not saying that there are not good academic philosophers, but there is a lot. Uh, he's criticizing that a lot as well. So I mean I <clears throat> I think it's a it's a great um, great uh, thing you're doing here, Marco and. And John, I also uh, looked at some of the books of, of John, but I I want to get more into that someday later. <laughs> okay. um, but thanks that you invite me over. <laughs> Thank you for coming. I mean, it's it's uh, it's very exciting that that you've worked with uh, with the author of the book that we're reading and you know, have a connection. That's really cool. Uh, and I'm glad that my Twitter my tweets worked. <laughs> that, that, it, that it, they actually reach somebody sometimes you know oftentimes the experience of, of tweeting or facebooking or participating in the larger infosphere is one of coldness and alienation and i feel that uh, i may be tweeting into the void and to to uh to know that somebody received it and responded to it in the way you have is um interesting yeah. uh, so yeah. yeah sometimes the bait gets uh gets to its destination uh, it's great. <laughs> all right so um so let, we'll we'll we'll, cont we'll follow up on this uh but we have one more to go and that would be uh yotam yes everybody can you hear me yes it looks like you uh, you're on two, two different uh, feeds uh, wait a minute sorry <laughs> i'm gonna i'm gonna okay. i'm going to uh delete your other one Looks like you have two feeds coming in. So one second. Uh, okay, there we go. Can you hear me? <coughs> yes. Perfect. Um, my name is Yotam and I'm an artist and animator from Israel. Um, I 
come to this uh, I came to this um, reading because I was uh, I was reading through the book and I was kind of uh, confused by some of the ideas and I was looking for a reader uh, just today and then I saw um, on the web that today starts a, a reading group for this uh, book so I was very excited um, my uh, the reason that I came to Slaughter to read Slaughter Dyke was from a design perspective. Um, uh, it's this sort of intuition that uh, some of his um, thoughts about the about media and the phenomenology of media um, might be applicable in design using new technologies or old technologies or just uh, to understand our um, our use of technology better um, and I came across uh, his ideas through Bruno Latour's uh, talks and also and um, articles uh, I don't come I'm not coming from uh, very thorough academic background. I did my uh, bachelor's in uh, Tel Aviv University. Some of it was philosophy. Um, yeah, I don't think I have that much more <laughs> to say. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it was very exciting to find out about the, this reading and uh, um, the whole enterprise of um, Cosmos Co-op, so yeah. Very glad no, I found. I'm glad you joined. Thank you. Uh, so, so that's everybody. And uh, except, I guess, I mean, I've talked, but I, I should probably say a little bit more about myself and my own particular path. Just getting to doing this group. I, um, long story short, but I was a philosophy major in college, uh, and I especially studied Nietzsche and Heidegger. Uh, and at the end of my college career, I had the option of continuing on and one path before me was potentially to do a, a PhD. Uh, although I hadn't learned German, I, one of the thoughts I had was that I would go to Germany and study there. And I had ideas about studying with Habermas or, you know, one of the, one of the other big names. Uh, but I, I didn't choose that path. Uh, and I, I had always felt a split within myself between a more, a more poetic side and a more philosophical side. Uh, and uh, I ended up choosing the, the, po the poetic side but I've never lost my longing for the spaces that I used to be in when I was in school, uh, in graduate seminars or you know, other contexts socially, uh, interacting with other students uh, and professors and having substantial discussions uh, about the material that, that we were reading. Uh, I've, I've always longed for that and I've never been able to return to that. Uh, in an institutional context. Uh, and the longing grew, you know, so intense that I decided to start an organization that would be in some sense dedicated to creating spaces for uh, deeper types of conversations, but outside of a institutional or, a, or an academic uh, environment. Uh, and really trying to kind of weave a path between the sort of commercialism on the one hand uh, and the sort of academicism, you know, on the other hand, and find a more aesthetic, I would say, uh, and literary even, um, sort of space or dimension or channel uh, in which to have conversations that wouldn't be limited necessarily to one particular mode of, of cognition or mode of communication. Um, but that would be inclusive of, uh, particularly uh, inclusive of the intellectual mode and, and academic and mental modes, because there's great depth to be found. Uh, it's just that it tends to get trapped inside of particular socioeconomic uh, and political um, matrices. So that's what this is about, and it's an experiment. It's you know, I'm, it's blow, it's it's blowing a bubble. It's not uh, a stable, defined, you know, rectilinear structure. Uh, that we have here, although the screen looks that way. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm very interested in this, in this idea of what, of what we might call collaborative dialogue and the sense that 
while you know each participant has their particular expertise or experience or familiarity or connections that that every participant has some thing something that they may sense or something that they could contribute to uh, forming a uh, more integrative um, understanding and um, and you know vision uh, of what we're even dealing with here because in some sense I think part of one of the things that we're dealing with is fundamental things, fundamental questions and issues or structures or realities. And, uh, and there's something, as Sloterdijk writes, that inspires and brings a group together. There's something that, 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 that keeps them uh, you know, in, 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 a, in a spherological relationship. But we'll get into all that. Um, the way I see the, these dialogues unfolding... Um, are in a couple of maybe phases or, or dimensions. Uh, one of which is that I think at, ba- at a baseline, we should establish some understanding of the text just on its own terms. Uh, I, I would like to try to begin there, like understand the text by reading the text or going to the text and letting it tell us what, what it's actually saying. Uh, I would add a second then dimension to that. And I don't mean to lay these out um, chronologically, necessarily, I, I just see them operative. But a second dimension would be an interpretation of this, the text. Okay, so we understand what it says. What does it? What does it mean? Uh, a, a third dimension, I think, uh, that we should include. Uh, and I'm, this is all open to revision and interpret you know, to, to your feedback, by the way. Um, is uh, the critique or criticism? Ed, you may want. You, know, you may have something particular to add. There, but I think all you know that that impulse uh, is natural and healthy in any in any sphere, and we should include that. Uh, and then I would add a fourth dimension, which is more of a wild card, and uh, I would see that as more literary or poetic or um, uh, even per- personal elaborations of or extensions of, of the text. In what ways does you know does it transcend in our own spaces? Uh, the um, you know what what just what is merely there what's purely there, uh, and I'd like to keep a space op- open for that as well. Now, so um, in terms of time, we we started at the top of the hour at, at noon my time. Uh, we're forty five minutes in now. Uh, what we found last year was that about ninety minutes is a good amount of time. Uh, sometimes we, we've been flexible in terms of going a little bit longer if, if the discussion is calling for that. And, um, and so we can do that, and uh, I'm available to do that. Uh, I don't have anywhere else to go. Um, but at, um, in 45 minutes from now, so a, a total of 90 minutes for the call, I'll, I'll try to kind of create a space for people to leave if they need to, if they have other things to get to. Uh, and we'll just try to keep to that sort of uh, rhythm. Uh, in the subsequent calls, but if you know, like I said before, this is experimental and this is collaborative. So uh, whatever I'm saying or whatever kind of parameters I'm laying out are open to uh, revision, uh, critique, feedback, etc. I'd actually like for us to take some meta perspective on the space that we're creating and uh, make it better for all of us. Uh, so uh, with that said, I'd like to turn it over to John and let him uh, begin with his wrap on you know, what he uh, sees going on, uh, particularly in these first, these first couple of sections of the book, uh, which are the preliminary reflections uh, and the introduction, if I got that right, preliminary note and, and the introduction. And once he does that, uh, and he, you know, John, you, I suppose you can take 10, 15 minutes, uh, we, I'll, I'll open it up, and uh, if, if you have something you'd like to add to the discussion, uh, you know, we'll just, we're just going to have to sense. It's a little bit clumsy with this many people on a call, and we could look actually in future calls on maybe splitting it up and having smaller groups because we could do that. With the technology, we can create kind of microspheres uh, and then merge back into our you know, ma- you know, mesosphere, whatever we want to call it. Um, but for today, I, I'd like for all, all to stay in the same group, and so after John gives his talk, we'll open it up and uh, more popcorn style, let you uh, contribute to and respond and ex- expand the conversation uh, from there. Sound good? All right. Uh, John, 
over to you. Uh, thank you, Marco. Um, I, and again, I apologize here that my video is not working. <laughs> For some reason, the technology was beyond us today. So I'm, I'm the disembodied voice. Uh, uh, I'm just going to give my uh, sort of off-the-cuff reflections on uh, what I read is the opening chapter. I've read it a few times now. Um, and of course, I've read all three volumes uh, in English, not the original German. So there's that liability. But um, so what I'd like to say is that um, the, the initial thing that strikes me when I read this is that part of the difficulty I think that people have with Sloterdijk are it, it may be that they come to him without not knowing enough about Heidegger because there's so much, there's, there's such a large degree to which what I suppose is Heidegger. And he opens doors that Heidegger closed. And for instance, the idea of being in the world for Heidegger did not mean being in a spatial container. He's very clear about this in uh, the history of the concept of time, for instance, where he talks about uh, being in the world means you're in the world doing something. Dasein, and Dasein uh, is always engaged in a task with a pre-philosophical understanding that is, comes to that task that's there. And he sort of takes Husserl's idea of bracketing the naive attitude, uh, where Husserl says that the, the naive attitude is something that will bracket and set aside, and it's the theoretical. Then Husserl, Heidegger turns that upside down, and it's precisely the naive attitude that interests him. So he takes the subject and embeds the subject into a world in which the individual is always engaged already. At the moment we cut to him, the individual is engaged in a task, doing something, and already has a kind of pre-philosophical of what that task is. But Heidegger was really clear that he did not want this to mean, um, you know, you're listening to my lecture, you're in a classroom, the classroom is a city, the city is in a town, the town is on a part of the globe, and you're in a world in that sense. He didn't want it to mean that because he didn't like uh, the mathematical geometrical implications that being in the world inside of a spatial container meant in that sense. And he's always trying to steer clear of mathematics, which is one of the things I liked about him because I've, I've been terrible at math, <laughs> math my whole life, even though I, I really admire it. Um, but then, you know, Sloterdijk precisely says, no, that's, that's what being in a world is. When we say that the human being is in a world, being in the world means that you are in a space. Humans are always, they are the anthropogenic animal that is always generating a world interior by excluding something that isn't part of that interior and taking the exterior in. So there's always a degree to which sphere formation has to do with incorporating an exterior, pulling it in, and entropically ejecting that which is inconsistent with whatever that idea of nature is. He says, we never relate to nature in a pure sense. There's always a sphere. There's always a world interior involved in whatever manner. As far back as you can go through history, humans are always relating to the outer world through a cosmology. And cosmologies are simply, um, as he says, metaphysics is applied immunology. And so these spheres have an immunological dimension to them. And this is one of the things I really like about Sloterdijk that's really interested me because I long ago figured out uh, from my studies in mythology and religion that these are vast immune systems and that uh, one of the great things about um, mythological studies and religions is that they create these world interiors that are these immune systems for entire civilizations that create a world space in which individuals can uh, interact with each other in, in accordance with the same myth. And so for me, the, the, the formation of a sphere, the formation of a world interior, and Sloterdijk gets more into this in, in the second volume in Globes, has a lot to do with the creation of a religion when you're talking about the macro spheres, when you're talking about the large uh, macro spheres that build civilizations, I don't think those spheres are possible without some kind of a religious event. And I invoke event here in the sense of Alain Badiou's idea of an event as something that is fundamentally world changing, where, uh, you know, Badiou says that there are these four different spheres in which an event takes place, love, politics, art, and science. And in each one of these spheres, the event is that which names the system. You come into a situation and bring in a new set of names, and through fidelity to a truth event, the individual is subjectivized and a whole new set of parameters comes in and the system gets renamed. So we have all these new names that come in. That's, a, that's kind of a, it's another way of saying that I think that a sphere process is taking place through an event. Events bring spheres into being. 
And in this book, uh, what I see Sloterdijk focusing on here is that the, the, he says is the minimal microspheric unit, which is the biune dyadic minimal microsphere. And he brings out the model of God creating Adam. So God creates Adam out of clay and he blows, he inspires Adam, takes Adam up and Adam becomes part of the breathed commune through the process of creating him by blowing breath into him, pneuma, ruach, and, and, and invests it into him. And it's already God's relationship with Adam is a reciprocal biune dyad in which a minimal microsphere has formed. So the minimal unit for Sloterdijk is never the solitary individual. It's always the biune dyad, the basic microsphere. And the microsphere uh, is any kind of relationship that forms between t- two people. And the mother and the child is the first and earliest, or perhaps, as he says in, in this book, is we'll get into the the womb, the individual in the womb with, with the placenta, uh, maybe the earliest microsphere that forms. But after that, uh, the relationship between the individual and the lover, the individual and the friend, um, or the individual and the God. And here, he, God blowing the spirit into Adam as the model for the inspired community, the breath that Adam shares with God in a reciprocal relationship that ties the two together through this process of breathing, exhaling, inhaling. They're exhaling and inhaling each other's air, and it creates a basic microspherological dyad. And without that, I think that um, civilization cannot form for slaughter It's This basic, I, I think he starts here at the individual level because what's going to happen is that the individual spheres that form are going to hook up with other individual spheres, and these spheres gradually connect and connect and connect to form eventually a macrosphere, which is the uh, maximal uh, spherological unit. The macrosphere is what holds a civilization together with an immune system that expels those elements which are inconsistent with what the society wants, and so those become immunologically deficient. They become those elements that the society does not want, so they're they're expelled to an exterior. And what the society does want is pulled into the interior and it becomes a world interior for society. Now, spheres are, um, as he points out in in this preliminary note, are fundamentally unstable. They have to, you have to keep doing work on them to keep them stable. Otherwise they pop, they rupture. And when when you get a ruptured sphere uh, on the micro level, you get like, let's say uh, the ending of a relationship. You're in a relationship with someone, the sphere pops, uh, the biune dyad pops, and you're left with uh, the ruins of a popped sphere, which is, you know, the, the memories, the empty apartment, the, the torn photographs. That is the microspheric counterpart to what happens when a sphere collapses with the macrosphere of a civilization. When you get blown out extinct languages, you get dead myths, you get civilizations, cities turning into decay and rusting and disintegrating and falling apart. That's a blown macrosphere on the macrospheric level. So, those two are seen as counterparts, as microspheric and macrospheric counterparts uh, with slaughter die here. And so this book, uh, and it will be very much about the, uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, what he calls a negative gynecology. There's a lot of, um, that he goes into about the relationship between the child and the mother that uh, I find very refreshing, uh, to be honest, that a lot of philosophers come away from or they think it's icky or, or whatever they don't want to talk about you know uh, the individual inside the womb and so forth and all the different non-objective what he calls non-objective structures borrowing from Thomas Mako a non-objective structure are these uh, they're non-objective because the individual inside the womb has not achieved a subject uh, the placenta or the call or the membrane or the blood that's fusing through them is experienced as it's kind of shadow form, so they're not, but um, he'll get more into that. But then in the second volume, it'll move into the macrospheres, the globes, and then in the third volume, as he outlines here in this preliminary note, he moves into foams that he sees characterizing. Foams are amorphous, they're structureless. Um, ever since the collapse of the civilizational macrosphere, I mean, the sky stopped functioning as an immune system, he says, with Copernicus, and then after that, um, we've had one existential crisis in the West after the next, but I think that after the 19th century, uh, the sense of us, all of us being on the inside of, this, of a shared macrosphere ceased. Uh, as we moved into the world wars, which were huge existential crises being in the world and 
you know, with Heidegger characterizing all this as a state of being thrown into the world. As he says, for the first time, we're thrown into the world. Uh, he says in another set of interviews that in the pre-metaphysical age, which is the age before Plato, uh, to be in the world meant to be in the body of the mother. It meant to be uh, part of the religious experience of the great mother. The sky was the goddess Newt, for instance. Um, you, were all, you always had the sense of being protected by an amniotic world interior that protected you and nourished you and looked after you. In the metaphysical age that begins with Plato, um, then being in the world meant being in the, in the father. It meant being in the paternal womb where the word is the primary creative instrument and the father appropriates all these structures, all these basic gynecological creative structures from the mother, they get appropriated. I think you can already see the shift happening in Gilgamesh, for instance, but, but they get appropriated, uh, pulled in, and they become part of this idea of being in the world as, as being looked over by a shepherd father who's always watching out for you and has the power of the word to create structures for you immunologically, which will help you. But then with modernity, starting as, you know, with Copernicus and the ending of the sky is an immune system where Copernicus sets the earth loose for the first time, sets it free amongst the stars to join the other stars as one star among all about it, um, the sky has failed to function as an immune system. Since then, it's been one existential crisis, all the way down to Heidegger, who announces for the first time that being in the world means to be thrown into the world. So you're thrown into a situation where you are shellless, you are no longer protected by either the father or the mother, and you're on your own to figure it out for yourself. That's the world of foam. That's the world that we've entered into where each individual's personal private microsphere bumps up against everyone else's microspheres, and it's an amorphous uh, foam that characterizes modern civilization, which he says is best epitomized in the apartment building, the apartment building with its cellular lattice of uh, individual cells. It's a perfect image of foam and what he means by foam. and It just typifies it. So we're all sort of, uh, each one of us now, is engaged in building his or her own microsphere and rubbing up against everyone else's microspheres. And we're creating this sort of, this new experiment, this amorphic world of foam, which is ontologically experimental. We don't know what's happening. We don't know what's going on. It's a total experiment. It's a total novelty. We're out for the first time in history, shellless, unprotected with no immune system. And there's, you know, there's a large degree to which it, it is a very chaotic situation, this, this social experiment. Uh, but that's where we're at. And so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you guys. And, uh, you know, and those are my, you know, reflections on the opening chapter. Can I ask a question, maybe? Yeah. So I was wondering, I, I, I couldn't really understand um, in the, the act of breathing, of God into Adam, what was the reciprocal thing about it? Because I understand it when I when you're talking when he was talking about the more general and sociological idea, but I wasn't I couldn't understand it on the example of Adam and uh, and God. Well, I mean, if I may answer, it, it, it's the shared breath. It's, it's the fact that <clears throat> God breathes into Adam and then Adam is basically breathing an atmosphere that is created by God. And so a Adam cannot exist without that exhalation, without, let's say, inhaling the CO2 <laughs> that's emitted by God. He cannot exist without that. And so that creates the basic microsphere between the two. And that becomes a paradigm for, he's really just sort of setting it up as a striking example of the formation of a microsphere as a model for how all microspheres form between individuals. And it doesn't have to be literalized in the sense that we're sharing each other's breath, but the breath is a symbol for the spirit. We are sharing each other's spirit. When we're in a relationship, whether it's an amorous relationship or a friendship or what have you, we, we are participating in a spiritual dimension where the breath becomes symbolic of that spirit, that spirit. So it, I don't think it's literal, but it, it's, you know, that would be my, my answer. To that. I, I have something I'd like to ask about or throw out there real quick, which is that I noticed um, in that description that you gave, John, that um, one of the things that I really attune to with this, and I don't think Sloterdijk talks about it really heavily directly, um, but is to take the microsphere, for lack of a better word, another level micro, that might be the way to put it, which is to say, 
you know, I interpret this notion of a microsphere, not necessarily at the individual to God or individual to individual dyad, but um, more micro as it were episodically, perhaps um, my, you know, a, a subjectivity relative to this group, for example, being, being a form of my own sort of subjective formation. And I don't know if I'm explaining it well, but I'll make a reference to um, someone mentioned earlier, uh, I think James Gibson and, and a notion of uh, I, broadly speaking, ecological perce perception, or per you know, the idea of the, the sort of, and I'm, I'm not an expert in this, so forgive me because I'm probably butchering the correct way to describe these things, but the, this kind of primal uh, creation of a self by virtue of an engagement that, that sort of does what it seems like is the same dynamic that Sloterdijk is talking about, taking in from the environment and then putting back out, you know, expelling certain things. So I, I just wanted to, I guess, put it out there and, and also ask, because I'm, I may be missing something here, uh, am, I, am I misreading or misunderstanding to think that this microsphere dynamic happens at levels that are, that are much more micro than a, a whole full-fledged human being in the world relative to another human being. I, my sense is that it can go more micro, but I, you know, again, I, I, and I don't mean to focus only on that, but I, to me, it seemed like a very important aspect of this, of this uh, process that Sloterdijk was talking about, that it's not, you know, it doesn't presuppose a fully formed human single individual with a kind of coherence, in order to have a spherological relation to God or to another individual, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense to me. And I think that, um, <clears throat> that uh, you're raising a good point there that with Sloterdijk, you know, these terms are not precise. Uh, they're, they're very, they're slippery. And, and Sloterdijk is very good with literature. He's very poetic and he understands the, you know, when he introduces an idea that's going to have ambiguities about it. And I think that you're raising a really good point here that microspheres are, you know, it's, it's kind of a slippery concept. You can apply it in many ways. I mean, it's a relative term. You can say that, uh, you know, there are these microspheric relationships between individuals, but what we're creating right here is a microsphere between all of us. Uh, it's a temporary evanescent um, bubble that we are engaging in that is creating a, a very small microsphere. So that's another type of microsphere that's totally alien to the world interior that we find ourselves in that make this microsphere possible. But every sphere, you know, I think that <clears throat> it might have been helpful, excuse me, <clears throat> if, if Sloterdijk had gone more into this holonic idea where spheres are spheres within spheres within spheres and these larger spheres make smaller spheres possible and, and so on ad infinitum. So I think it's a good point. John, that was really, that was fantastic, down to Badu. I loved it. Um, I have some, quite, yeah, it was great. Uh, some questions, um, just bounce some things off. And the first is with, um, with Heidegger and how uh, you articulate it, you're showing how he's sort of trying to rewrite Heidegger. And what struck me was the difference in the stress on space and time, these older Kantian stresses and how Heidegger early tried to um, extract space from time and gave that up. And uh, perhaps that has something to do with the projects differing, that he's privileging space. And then I wonder if um, there's a lot to, I, would, I don't want to go into a whole side thing on Heidegger here, but I wonder if something like the fourfold isn't a kind of half-baked way of trying to recover a sphere in which mortals are that's a great, that's sort of, of embedded in, right? Yeah. This repetition yeah. of holding, yeah. yeah. Um, so the, uh, I also got from your description spheres as a kind of autopoiesis, um, loosely in terms of uh, Varela and Maturana and Lumen, particularly macrospheres like nation states that are really trying to define boundaries of what counts inside and what doesn't count outside in some kind of protective, self-regulating sense, so that there may be some system parallels to this. What, what do you think? Let me just stop here. What do you think of that, that notion that there's something yeah, autopoetic about this? <clears throat> uh, yeah, yeah, I love that, the, the direction you're taking this with, with uh, Maturana and Varela and the idea of autopoiesis. Um, I think there's a huge degree to which autopoiesis is, is, is involved here. And uh, I mean, it's something worth thinking about. People could write papers on this. I mean, to what degree 
Are these spheres autopoietic? Are they self-forming? Is there something that is a larger process that happens that's beyond the control or the parameters of the individual consciousness where these spheres are, um, they're self-moving. I mean, something is working itself out with us and using us as organelles. <laughs> Parts of cells that are, that are organizing larger <clears throat> interior spaces and we're sort of being organized by these larger macro forces. I think that's, that's a really good discussion point because uh, Slaughter kind of shies away from that, but the, the parameters that he sets up kind of invite that to, to, for us to go in there and ask, to what degree are these spheres autopoietic? To what degree, and if they are autopoietic, what's, where are these forces coming from that's shaping them? Um, yeah, these are excellent ideas. That's, that's what I love about stuff like this is that, you know, in dialogue with other people, you just bring light in that you can't see on your own. And it's just, that's, that just opened up a whole, I don't know. I'm really excited all of a sudden. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, um, let me, if I could just add, hey, I appreciate it. This is great. Um, there's actually um, some social theorists who are not yet, are just becoming known in the States. They come out of England around the work of Roy Baskar, um, who I think is just, just was a phenomenal philosopher. Um, critical realism. And these critical realist social theorists, particularly a woman named Margaret Archer, who studied with Bourdieu, <laughs> is developing a notion of morphogenetic society. She has a whole team. And she's actually trying to account for something like the modern, the 19th, 20th century shift in the rapidity of change of social structures, which would parallel the emergence of foam and the breakdown of microspheres. So I just, I want to, I you know, think about how there might be less poetic and more sort of systemic ways uh, of thinking about this. And um, so... And the last, here's a question I have, the question of time. It would seem that somehow foam and the chaos we're in, I wonder if it's not just space, but it has something to do with the speed or time of change. And so my question, I don't know Slaughterdyke very well at all, is is there a place of time and temporality in this for him um, beyond just the spatial metaphors of spheres? The question of time and temporality for Slaughterdyke. Marco, I bet you have a thought on that. It's, you were attracted to this because of the, the spatial aspects as, as it's sort of opposite of Gebser's uh, emphasizing the temporal aspects. I, I bet you could shed some light on that. I mean, I'm just guessing. Uh, it, Jeffrey here, I, I had, to, I had yeah. a thought about this because... So, uh, sorry, I was muted. Um, is that you, Jeffrey? I'll yeah. Why don't, why don't you go ahead? I do have a thought uh, in in in, res, in relation to Michael's question, uh, but but I'll let you go first. Well, well the first thing I because one of the things I wanted to talk about in relation to what John was talking about is the way Slaughterdyke talks about things, not just what he's talking about, because his argument is not argument. It's not an argument in a in a standard sense. It's a set of analogs. It's an argument by analogy rather than by direct uh, logical structures. And his images in the book are as important as the text itself. So looking at, so when I read, I'm constantly looking at the image because the images don't say the same thing as the text. Often they're not even referred to in the text, but they say something complementary. And so it's partly about this, I think it's partly about this autopoesis link as well, that there are, that it's not just a verbal text, it's also a visual text. And it's saying something about other ways of talking about these things. Regarding the time, I also find it curious when I'm reading Slaughterdick, the whole book of bubbles, or at least half of it, is a, medieval look at uh, the bubble and how it develops and how these ideas of intimacy develop. So even though he's talking about space, he's using a historical argument to talk about space. And so the time is there, but it's kind of implicitly built into the argument rather than explicitly stated. So I don't know whether how people 
understand could, that could or whether something... I whether that corresponds to other people's understanding of it. Could you say something more about the medieval aspect of it? What well, it just about? seems a very historical, a historicity kind of approach to exploring. So, so, I mean, obviously the medieval part of what he's saying, which I think is really interesting, is that the understanding of space in medieval times wasn't the same as our modern understanding of space. So he's using the medieval kind of exploration to say something very profound about the fact that our understandings of space have changed. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then he's also, so, so there's something very temporary about or change related about that process. <clears throat> Well, I think this would be one place to make a connection with, with Gebser uh, and, and the notion of time. Because in Gebser, what happens going from medieval worldview or world to a modern one is that, uh, is that the human becomes um, basically space aware. Uh, and space emerges as a primary <coughs> dimension in, in modern mental consciousness is that's that's how that's how Gabeser talks about it uh and uh in that sense i mean space becomes something that can be manipulated it can become uh abstracted uh, it can be divided into you know multiple sectors or quadrants or points uh into lattices matrices uh and that's a particularly modern not just a modern uh, act but a modern capability uh, it's it's not something that was capable that that people were capable of before a certain point in the emergence of, of consciousness structures. This is Geb, this is Gabster talking. Um, but uh, I mean, what I think is particularly interesting, what was initially compelling to me about Sloterdijk, is the notion that space can can be fundamentally understood in, through spherical forms. The, 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 the vision, the image of a sphere, of something that's rounded, uh, that is not necessarily uh, the, the, the kind of mathematical uh, matrix uh, that is characteristic of, of modernity or modern consciousness or me mental, uh, mental rational uh, consciousness. Uh, that to me suggested a different understanding of time as well. Uh, because to be in, in a sphere is to be in a different kind of time than to be in a matrix. Uh, and one of the ways I think that that's illustrated in the text is through this idea of inspiration, and this idea of breath coming in, breath coming in and filling, uh, the, the, whether filling the self or filling the, the, um, filling the man as an atom being breathed into uh, by, by, by God. Uh, and I think that the temporal dimension comes in uh, st kind of Im implicitly, st stealthily, even in the notion of breath. Because breath, if you just breathe, if you, if you sit and breathe, it's, it's a temporal process, right? It's both temporal and spatial. I mean, it's temporal in that it unfolds with a rhythm, with a regularity. Uh, we true. know that we're alive because we're breathing. Uh, if you have a child, if one of the main things you will do is check that the child is breathing. I remember when we had our baby, she was a yeah. baby. We had a premature, uh, um, our first daughter was premature, and it was, our, it was a constant anxiety. Is she breathing? Uh, and we would constantly, irrationally, we would check to, to make sure, sure that she was. But when you breathe, what happens? Your lungs fill. So there's a spatial expansion in the lungs themselves. This is a primordial, you know, fundamental human experience. And it has to keep happening. It has to keep, you have to inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. And I'm, I'm barely even breathing right now because I'm talking. <laughs> but um, the way or the dimensionality with which you're able to breathe, which has something to do with the atmosphere as well, and this, the kind of space around you, is the atmosphere breathable? Is it polluted? Is it toxic? Is, it, is there some poison in the atmosphere, which I feel that is actually the case in our modern phonological world that our atmospheres are poisoned uh, then then that affects how we, how we breathe and that affects how we experience our own time uh, th those would, those would be some initial reflections or just on on how those themes might interrelate uh, but it's very it's 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 very interesting 
for sure. Uh, um, I was going to say, uh, and first of all, it's what you talk about breathing, uh, and, and you're talking right now. It's what you're talking is is actually manipulating your breath in a way to to form symbols in this immunological space of intersubjectivity, uh, which uh, which. It, so, so I think, uh, I mean, the, the whole concept of immunolo of the sort of immunolo immunology feels like there's a lot to unpack there. And I'm not entirely sure that I, that I get entirely, but, uh, uh, but, it, but, I, but it's sort of an interesting aspect to explore. What I, what I kind of am curious about is, um, you know, he talks about these, these spheres and levels in, in terms of intersubjectivity, like between people primarily. And, and between God and, uh, and man and, and other things. I'm kind of wondering if uh, we would apply this spherology to like our perception or like you know, is a scientist in a spherological relationship with their work? Is, is an astronomer in a spherological relationship with the stars he's studying? And I think this kind of gets into uh, uh, an interesting uh, implication when we get into like Rick Tarnas and his whole idea of, um, of the sort of participatory cosmos. I'll just quickly sort of second that by saying that's, I think that's partly what I wanted to get at earlier. And uh, I'll, I'll put out a word that I know is, has strong reactions in people, but uh, the post-human perspective. And just to be clear, I do not mean the transhuman perspective, but the post-humanism. Uh, Bruno Latour was also mentioned earlier, someone who certainly I think has some connections with Sloterdijk, but uh, the, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in that process of autopoietically creating a relationship at a, at a level that isn't quite, a, you know, it doesn't presuppose the fully coherent beings just to, just to sort of plus one that, that last, last question. Ed, looks like you're talking. You're muted. The of the sphere. Where he talks, so we're all talking here about these spheres that are there, but why does it have to be a sphere? What, what is so compelling other than it gives me an image to focus in on, on a, a dyadic relationship that I, that I want to explore? Why, why the sphere? I mean, it, it, it makes sense in the sense that it's round and it can be equidistant and it can, it can have various sides and I can, I can put them inside each other and things like that. But I'm not getting the, the necessity. I'm not getting exactly what it is that the sphere itself is adding to everything that's been said thus far. Why that? that, that that's the part where I stumbled for. So I, you know, because when I, when I, when I read the, the creation, I get this inspiration thing. That was a one-time event in our mythology. It happened once. There's never been an inbreathing since then. So, so to take that and say, oh, and that's how a sphere comes about and it never happened again, but we have spheres everywhere. How, how does that, how does that work? Because I can get this idea of, well, I like to kind of separate myself from other things because it allows me to focus. But where's the compulsion? That's what I'm not getting right now. The floor is open. Uh, anyone can respond. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, I don't think that. I'm not trying to be hard, hard over about anything. I'm really, this is a truly heartfelt. Uh, question of uh, help me understand why this is, has to be this way what's this what's this adding to the party what does this everybody well, not everybody but most people you know I'm, I'm a pretty big gapeser fan okay because i i think it's a it's a helpful way of looking at things and i can use it in my everyday life to to kind of help me make sense of some things that don't always make sense to me and so that's what I'm looking for here, too. I'm looking for something I can pull out and say, okay, this helps me get through my everyday life. That, that's what I'm looking for. And I'm not, and I'm not getting that by, by this sphere thing right now. And so just well, it doesn't um, have to be answered definitively either. Well, I think, I mean, I mean sphere is obviously a, a symbol, right? And I think, I think what, what I get out of it is that um, – 
you know, like I used to sort of like picture interceptivity in terms of lines, you know, connect you know, subject A to subject B, but like having the sphere as an image kind of makes me think about that space in which that inter intersubjectivity happens, you know, that's the sort of immunology, the, the womb space that he talks about. Um, and, and so like that, it's the, so for me, it's the idea that intersubjectivity is not just a one-to-one -one meeting, but it's, a, but it's the creation of a space in which that meeting happens. Um, I actually find it interesting contrasting with um, another uh, philosopher, Graham Harmon in his uh, object-oriented ontology, because for, for Harmon, no two objects actually interact directly. They always interact within a larger object. Um, I, I think Sardik is in, in many ways saying the opposite of that, 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 that the sort of larger object, the sphere, creates the, uh, like, like creates a, a connection that, that wouldn't be there otherwise. Um, but but yeah, I, I think I think a sphere as that immuno as that immunological space uh, in which the in which the, the connection happens. Um, and as far as you know, the breath and the atom. I mean, we're breathing all the time, and you know, our our talking, as I mentioned earlier, is breathing towards one another. I mean, uh, your know, breath is not is, is since not our own. It's is what we take in from the environment and exhale out in the uh, to be breathing by others. So it's so there's. Uh, so it also has that kind of shared space meaning. I have a very small thing to say, which might, uh, so I think, I don't know if, if this was your question, Ed, but it sounded like part of the question was why, why spheres over other shapes of enclosure, right? Because I think, I think to what Jonathan just said, the point is, it seems to me at least that it's about, it's about thinking in terms of enclosures, right? And, the, and this autopoietic, or at least, arguably autopoetic, but certainly a creative enclosure making. And the only thing I would say in defense of why spheres over other shapes of enclosures is that spheres are cornerless. They're, they're cornerless shapes, right? And so I think there's something to the cornerlessness of these shapes that I think is really relevant here. And that's literally all, all I could possibly add to this, but I figured I'd say it because it felt relevant to that last. Well, just just a quick, quick add on to that. Yeah. There's, there's also what uh, sort of I call rounding events. Uh, which you could envisage, envision as you know something that something that actually takes a corner or takes an edge, takes a rough edge off, either by including it or by by excluding it uh, in some way. And so that is a function of what the sphere does or what the what the people in the spheres uh, do. I would also argue, like what Nate was saying, is if you think about nature in general, there are no corners and there are no perfectly straight lines and there are no hard edges, so to speak. Everything is very amorphous and very curved. And so I guess a sphere, yes, but even a sphere in my mind is not perfectly cylindrical because even if you think about the forces of gravity and the orbits of the planets and stuff like that, it's it state, you know, it's kind of like an amoeba and it kind of moves depending on the forces that are acting against it. So, I mean, I would argue that it's not strictly just a sphere, but it's a good um, alternate thing to focus on as opposed to the boxes and the very concrete linear buildings and apartments and compartments, literally compartmentalizing what we do mentally to put things into boxes so that we can figure them out. Um, and just on another topic, since we've been talking about the breathing in and out, the one thing that struck me as I was reading the introduction was... Um, he, they talk about breathing life into man who was made out of clay and it was this empty vessel. And it was only at that inspiration moment that life began. And, you know, there was this uh, unity with God or whatever. And I kept trying to think, well, what, what was everything prior to that? Like anything I remember reading in biblical studies was, you know, God created the earth and then he created like the oceans and he created the plants and then he created the animals. And I'm like, well, was man the only one stupid enough not to breathe on his own? Because somehow the, the bears figured it out. The birds figured it out. The fish knew how to breathe in water, but yet man needed God to breathe into it before we could do anything. So just mm -hmm. throwing it out there. So I'm not quite sure how that fits in all of this, but I'm like, gosh, were we that stupid? <laughs> uh, no, actually, if I can answer your question, though, the other creatures that were created all breathed. The text, the text tells us that. And, and what the text also tells us um, I know John likes likes the word uh, wuah and spirit there, but spirit doesn't appear anywhere in that in that whole story. It doesn't show up at all. They use they other words are used for that. 
So, okay. what, so what words? Neshama uh, is 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 what God does. It's the Germans would say literally. It's the the breath of life, and and then and and Adam then becomes a living soul. The word is uh, um, nefesh is what he becomes. And this, but before that, the, the birds are the creatures of the, the sea and whatnot. They, 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 they breathe. Okay. They, but they don't have life. Yeah. But it's, 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 and it's with, because they also have nefesh, but he became a nefesh. The other ones were given nefesh. You see, so there was a, there's a difference between being given something and becoming something. That's also in the story. But, but that, that doesn't fit real well into what, what Sloterdijk wants to do with the story. We use these stories for particular purposes and reasons. I, you know, because that's one of the things I looked at very closely. And, 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 and another odd thing about that story that he quotes is it talks about all of that mud there's all that water around, but he formed God forms Adam from dust, dr the driest substance you can imagine. And I don't know how this dry stuff gets there. Right. It's just, it's well, just what there. He, and what did he create the, the other creatures out of? He, he water out of, out of the word. I have to go back to what John was saying earlier, but the word in this manifestation of what I create from the word. He, he speaks and it happens. But with man, Adam, it's different <laughs> in, that, in that story. That's the first you know, one. You know, if I could interject, it's interesting that we're focusing on this right now because it's, it's like a preview of coming attractions because once we get down to Foams, um, Foams opens up with Sloterdijk talking about modernity beginning uh, on the battlefields of World War I with the poison gas attacks against the breathability of the atmosphere by the Germans against the French at Ypres. Um, what is it, 19, uh, 1912, 13? It, um, that begins for Sloterdijk. That, that's for him, that's the first time that the breathability of the opponent's atmosphere becomes a target for the first time. And he says that's, that's characteristic of uh, these atmo, what he calls atmo terrorist attacks on the sustainability of spheres uh, is at issue. And it's an issue all through modernity, all, all the way down to, if you think of the Ohm Shinriko nerve gas attacks that took place in Tokyo in the 1990s, where they, once again, that was another assault on the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. If you can assault your enemy's atmosphere, the very conditions that sustain their uh, breathability, that moves, that moves culture into, into a new dimension that, that's totally, that's characteristic of modernity for Sloterdijk and will be at issue in foams. So it's interesting that we're focusing on this right now because it, it becomes one of his main points, I think, later on, is that the spheres create sustainable interiors and breathability is one of the main characteristics of being in a sustainable interior. I mean, yes, it, but if it, I can attack those later. terroristically, then they're not sustainable, are they? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I think this translates to what we call the infosphere. I mean, because I mean, clearly one of the tactics that <clears throat> certain actors are using and a number of actors are using on the world stage now sociopolitically is to, it's not, it's not to point, it's not to um, promote a particular ideology or agenda necessarily, but to just confuse the hell out of everybody. Like to, to literally poison, to poison the well or to poison the atmosphere so that, not, not so that somebody, so that people believe your point of view, but so that they don't know what to believe. And this, you know, is, you know, has come to light and this has come to, you know, to lighten the phenomenon of what's called fake news. Um, but you, we also, you know, we, we know that it's a specific, it's a governmental and even it's a governmental tactic uh, that um, has been deployed. You know, we're, we're breathing that in. Uh, people are breathing that in now and suffering the uh, effects uh, of that kind of, um, of that kind of, uh, uh, action or effect. Uh, so uh, th I think that's part of why the sphere, the sphere metaphor or the sphere image is, is relevant is that, um, it changes the focus. Uh, whereas with an idea, with the idea of say Heideggerian being in the world 
uh, and with the kind of, I think, you know, spiritual, or religious, metaphysical like, tradition, the idea is to look within, to look inside of yourself, right? That, that's the classic um, move that you would make in, as a spiritual being. Uh, but what I think Sloterdijk is saying with the sphere image is, is to look around. L- what's the space that you're in? What are you, what are you taking in and exchanging with? Uh, oh, really? And not oh, just man. on the physical level of you know, breath, that's, that's a, more of a metaphor for what we're doing in terms of our semiological uh, existence and our consciousness. You know, can't get away from the sphere. I mean, even in, implicit in that word around is like your environment is already spherological just to, even in that word. I, it was, I was thinking of McLuhan's idea that the, every, when you were talking, Marco, about the infosphere, that every new technology that basic idea that every new technology configures a new environment, but the environment that it configures is usually unconscious. Um, and that the job of the artist then is to bring to conscious awareness what the unconscious environment is. And the artist steps up the environment through uh, the metaphors and images in a work of art that make that invisible environment visible. And that's the only way of making it visible. That's the only way a society can see its own ontological preconditions for its existence is through its artists. That's why artists are so essential uh, to making visible to us what it is, what the nature of the waters that we're in really is. So it was funny when you mentioned that, Marco, I was thinking of McLuhan's idea about the totality of environmental conditions configured by media. I just want to note, it's uh, been going for just over 90 minutes uh, and uh, just check in, see how folks are doing do we do we want to keep going do we want to kind of you know close it here and set the stage for for uh, our next uh, call or for any you know inter uh, discussions in, in in the meantime uh just open like uh, how, is, how's everybody doing and is there anything urgent that you know you think we should address uh now in this call <laughs> So then, uh, any um, any reflections? Then, any sort of final reflections on what we've talked about so far, uh, and thoughts on how we could make this conversation fruitful, how we could uh, sustain and expand the, the sphere, or make, make whatever sphere we have here, um, you know, nourishing for us. Uh, I mean, I, I want to hold to some intention for. For, for the group as a whole, you know, how, even though we're kind of coming together as our own little bubbles, and of course we have our own uh, motives and, and uh, desires, uh, but like, where do we really want to go with this, I guess, is, is what I'm asking, because uh, I, I, I find that one of the things in, that, that is attractive to me in the book uh, is, and that we didn't really discuss is this this idea of looking at what it is it what is it that brings people together? What is it that creates, you know, creates uh, spheres or creates like, spaces uh, that are habitable? Uh, if if the larger infosphere is, let's just say, you know, just go with this, uh, um, you know, just go with this as a thought experiment. If it's poisoned, and and we we actually need spaces that are where the air is breathable. Uh, then how do we create those spaces, and how do we inhabit them in a you know as as uh, you know as healthy, sane you know <laughs> human being? I don't I don't know how else to say this. I'm struggling a little bit w- with the words, but I mean I, I don't want this is not just an intellectual exercise, as, as I guess what I'm what I'm trying to say, uh, and um, <clears throat> I think it's particularly important because. Uh, what, I mean, I, I, what I see happening now in in the world, in our social world, especially, is extreme, um, extreme uh, sort of hyper connection and hyper alienation happening happening at the same time. And I don't know exactly how to resolve those two. I mean, just before I got on this call, I was um, I got pulled into a conversation thread because somebody in our network on social media on Facebook particularly had, had posted something suicidal and uh, the kind, in other words, was indicating that he, he was considering committing suicide. That's how we interpreted it. And this drew a response from a number of people who were, who were connected with him 
all of whom shared an alien, all of whom shared a, a sense of distance from or separation from this individual, and yet at the same time a caring for and a sensitivity to him. Uh, and there is something to do with how our spheres are formed in the social world. And, this, and one, one thing about this person too is high, very, very strong intellect, a very strong mind, a uh, very deep thinker. Uh, but nonetheless had come to this point of, of what we could see as his own spherological crisis, uh, which you know, potentially has led him to take his own, his own life. Uh, so this is not just academic, in other words, uh, it's existential as well, uh, and, it's, and it's timely. Uh, and um, I don't expect a particular response to that necessarily, but it's something I want to put on the table that like, I, I want to go someplace with this. I want to see what we could really, um, we can really unpack or unfold or create or inflate uh, th- uh, through these dialogues. And, and I'd love to hear some reflections on that as we close off this particular talk. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing I often think about politically is, you know, creating counter spheres against the sort of uh, hegemonic sphere of neoliberal capitalism in like the, uh, the, in the sort of destructive uh, effects it has on, um, you know, on on the environment, on our society. Yeah. How do you, how do you create uh, healthy spheres within a deeply unhealthy society? Um, And how can we grow those in order to, uh, to propagate them in uh, counter the hegemony of, the sort of toxic sphere that we're in. I would like to add something um, from my point of view in here in Israel, and I think it's also uh, relevant um, to people in Istanbul and uh, people in uh, New York um, and other places around the world. And I was very, um, I'm very intrigued by the way if we're talking about speciality when talking about slaughter dyke there's something very special going on uh, around the world where um for me specifically and i i saw it with other people from other cities that there is a strong connection between people uh, in, in large cities like london beirut tel aviv Paris, uh, and etc., that find more connection with one another and in a much safer um, spheres with it that are but um, more that more safer than they feel uh, other places in their own countries, so in their own nation states. So when you're talking about spheres, there is something very interesting going on where. It's geographically pretty scattered around uh, these locuses of, um, of the spheres that were um, uh, crystallized, that have crystallized, are, um, have been crystallized through probably exchanges that are, has a lot to do with information. Uh, tra- the way information traveled or education or arts from city to city and not necessarily locally within the same country. So th- that's just a thought about geography, speciality and spheres and politics, I guess. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else want to offer some... Uh, let's see, Nate, you need to leave. So see you later. Thanks. Thanks, Nate. Yeah, thanks. It, this has been awesome. I really appreciate okay. it. Look forward to more. Yeah. Time. Cool. Nice meeting you. All right. Going once, going twice. Any any last uh, reflections before we say goodbye? All right. Then in that case, um, I want to thank you all for coming. I found that to be a really enriching conversation. Yeah, it was. It was great. It was great. And we're we're going to do this again in two weeks. Uh, so this is one of the things too. I, I wanted to give some space to let, let let our conversation kind of gestate and let it unfold and let us think about things. Uh, the text, you know, as John noted earlier, although I do may disagree, is 
relative, it's definitely easier than Heidegger to read. I don't think, I don't think you can dispute that. Uh, and, and, um, so we have time to think about things. Uh, we have our, the forum, uh, uh, channel as well for asynchronous, um, conversations. Um, and, um, and it'll be the same time, same deal uh, two weeks from now. Hopefully, we'll be able to see John. Uh, we can work on troubleshooting. <laughs> we'll fix it. Um, and uh, uh, once again, appreciate you all being here. Uh, and I uh, hope to see you in a couple of weeks. Okay. Thank you. Marco. All right. Thank you. Marco. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Marco. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure meeting, meeting all of you. Likewise.